Thank you so much, Cindy, for your paper. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Philip Whalen as our next presenter. Philip Whalen is professor in history at Coastal Carolina University. Um, he's the author of numerous articles, book chapters, and books. I will only name the first two here. That's okay. Um, French historians, 1900 to 2000, the new historical writing in 20th century France, and his most recent book, Place and Locality in Modern France. Philip's paper today is entitled Labor and Culture in Burgundy's Phylloxera Epidemic. Thank you so much, Philip. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, I'm, in the interest of saving time, I'll cut out the parts that relate to migration, although in the question and answer period afterwards, I could talk about Burgundians who come to California in the 1880s because of phylloxera. But I anticipated that. But to launch right in, uh, the phylloxera epidemic as felicitous disaster. Um, the French were ill-prepared to defend their wine industry from the aphid invasion that swept through France between the late 1850s and late 1880s. While complete industrial and ecological catastrophes were eventually averted, the changes affected to ensure complete recovery by the early 1900s not only thoroughly modernized the French wine industry, they also, as I will develop uh, below, permanently altered the cultural and ecological geographies of the areas impacted a fact often ex obscured by the rhetoric and scholarship of terroir, with its emphasis on timeless practices and the long durée. Although the French weathered a significant odium, or white rot, um, blight during the 1850s, they would unfortunately make similar mistakes as they struggled with in initial incredu incredulity um, poor scientific information, grudging acceptance, and limited remedies during the combat with the phylloxera aphid. Odium had, was a significant um, blight in its own right. It had reduced annual yields um, of 45 million hectoliters of grape juice down to a low of 11 million hectoliters by 1844. So we're talking industrial disaster scale here. Early responses were hesitant and often ineffective. Challenges related to better understanding the threat were compounded by the mistaken and somewhat chauvinistic assumption that odium was the problem, which, preclu which precluded adequate consideration of any role the vines themselves might contribute. Numerous crackpot remedies were essayed. These range from flamboyage, herbal bonfires intended to dry the vineyard environment and make it less hospitable, uh, saline injections into the roots of plants, soapy mists that were to hover above the grounds, um, a variety of chemical plasters, um, live animals such as snails and chickens let loose in the vineyards, seafood emulsions, fertilizer cocktails, uh, snail slime, animal or human urine, whale oil and mixed with gasoline, powdered tobacco, um, co-planting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they even blame phylloxera for the introduction of new hand tools into viticulture. In the end, trial and error determined that only regular and well-timed treatments, not before heavy rains, et cetera, of copper sulfate injected into the root area with an oversized industrial syringe called a PAL injecteur, in combination with the possible attenuation of odium's own aggressiveness, saved France's vineyards and wine industry. The blight subsided in the late 1860s. Um, besides, um, bes however, because it killed its host, phylloxera presented a more formidable pest than odium. The pale yellow louse, a member of the aphid family, measuring one to five or more millimeters, hence visible to the human eye, unfortunately is typically underground though. Uh, the aphid attacks and gradually weakens vine roots, creating deformations on the roots uh, and making the vine increasingly susceptible to various fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Unlike odium, which, in which the pest was easily detected because much of the damage was done above the roots, phylloxera could take five to 10 years to detect because it attacked the smaller underground roots of younger, healthier vines, which delayed the, which delayed, um, the various impact. 
whereas the solution in the end was to import American rootstocks onto which French vines were grafted, the immediate response was that French growers denied the possibility that there was anything inherently weak or problematic about French vines. They preferred to focus instead on what might be attacking them. Initial responses range from the flooding of vineyards to drown the aphids during the winter season, only poss possible in relatively flat areas, which also exacerbated a uh, lingering odium, to planting in sandy soils, which made acreage in new areas attractive, but not ideal for vineyards, and to the addition of substantial amounts of fertilizer, which had best served to lengthen the life of dying vines. Because chemical treatments had worked to combat odium in the end, the application of insecticides was preferred, but, to, but not very economically feasible. Potassium carbonate and sulfur carbonate were used effectively, but at great expense, and only where a plentiful water supply was available. These treatments entail considerable, considerable financial outlay, not only for the chemicals, but also for pumping and irrigation equipment, along with the employment of additional semi-skilled labor most often women and children. George Ordish describes the stages of incredulity, apathy, and resistance among Burgundian growers during the 1870s. He also identifies incidents of forcible resistance to the obligatory destruction of, in, of infected vines. Similarly, Robert Laurent discusses how a crowd of 150 vignerons formed, a re, formed to resist a forcible chemical treatment of their vineyards in Chenove, just south of Dijon, in August of 1879. The group's alleged ringleader was arrested, acquitted by a sympathetic jury, and released to a hero's welcome. Phylloxera's immediate impact on the French wine industry was disastrous. This may be grasped through Marcel Lachivier's statistics concerning reductions in grape juice production. Whereas French vineyards had cut, well, let me skip some of this stuff. Um, let me just specify that uh, production dropped by about 60% during the 1770s. Following the French government's offer in 1870 of a 20,000 franc award raised to 300,000 francs in July of 1874, but never awarded despite thousands of petition, petitions, for whoever could find an effective and practical solution to the blight, a slew of highly publicized scientific and professional expeditions were organized to gather potential vine stock samples from various parts of the United States. And with assiduous trials in French lab laboratories and vineyards, the solution to the phylloxera epidemic, unlike the case of odium, was found to be biological rather than chemical. The solution was to graft mature French vines on disease-resistant American vine roots that thrived in European conditions. In the immediate run, however, a combination of wounded Gallic pride, cultural aversion to the alleged fruity, immature, and savage taste of American wines, and the unimaginable expense replanting would impose on already challenged growers conspired to engender general resistance. Instead, growers and winemakers engage in, live, in lively debates between the av advocates of grafting, known as the Americanistes, and the sulfureurs, who are partisans of com continued chemical treatments and gradual evolution. Whereas the two camps were relatively equal in terms of influence in 1879, the advocates of annual chemical treatments prevailed in the short term because chemical technologies were familiar to growers, did not require retraining their workforces, and avoided the substantial initial outlay necessary to purchase new vine stocks, often already grafted as various new industries developed to address the Americanists' needs, or grafting machines and training grafters. While different approaches were used concurrently, flooding continued in those areas were feasible, for example, and even by adjoining neighbors within the same terroir, the tide definitely turned in favor of grafting, uh, whip, whip and tongue style, known as greffe anglaise, and wholesale planting by the mid-1880s. The Burgundian wine industry's fate was seemingly determined at the agricultural competition of Paris in 1894. Um, the Ministry of Agriculture awarded a gold medal for wine based on blind tasting made by Jean-Baptiste Tavernier from Burgundy's Meursou region um, for a wine um, 
vinified from plants grafted on American roots. This distinction turned the tide as the vast majority of wine growers who had not already turned to other forms of agriculture, apiculture, or arboriculture were finally convinced of the effectiveness of grafting and began to plant American rootstocks in their vineyards. Now, flocks were officially arrived in Jeuvry Chambertin, the Côte d'Or, the heart of Burgundy's wine country, only in 1878. Just as the French government forbade the importation of foreign vines, roots, and leaves in order to stem the problem. Within two years, the pest was ravaging through the, the Côte d'Or. Um, Jevray Chambertin's municipal council quickly organized a commission for vigilance against the phylloxera invasion in that year. Dijon took three more years, despite having been ordered by the Ministry of Agriculture to do so three years earlier. Um, Replanting initiatives largely adhered to Jules Guyot's dogmatic recommendations dating from the 1860s. Guyot had called for fewer vines to be planted per hectare, with single plants trellised along ordinary, orderly rows, as opposed to being layered uh, en provinage, clustered or staked around one original plant, as often is the case in Italy, or grown on tresses or trees, along with, along with a reduction in the use of fertilizers. These recommendations provided the blueprint for the eventual rationalization, reordering, and mechanization of French vineyards. The immediate hindrance lay in the fact that growers had little opportunity to, to implement his vision because they preferred to retain their mature vines, which established the quality and reputation of their wines, and could not, without risk of stressing their vines, cut them to Guyot's recommended specifications. Phylloxera, however, forced the issue all, all at once. With rare exceptions, the epidemic necessitated the complete replanting of French vineyards on resistant American rootstocks. The process of replanting uh, Burgundy's extensive and venerated vineyards provided an unprecedented and ultimately beneficial opportunity to regulate, standardize, and innovate in various aspects of viticulture. Notable changes including require that vines be planted in fixed rows, trellised at standardized heights, limited to selected varietals at the expense of other uh, hybrids that people were using then, and zoned apart from other parts other uh, kinds of agriculture. Horses, tractors, or stationary winches could now navigate long rows of trellis vines to pull plows, chemical fertilizers, sprayers, haul grapes, and eventually, by the mid-20th century, to harvest grapes directly. The resulting monoculture also had far-reaching ramifications for the region's geography. The, the contraction and concentration of vineyards on the most advantageous lands led to increase, increased agricultural segregation, homogenization, and improve quality. It also freed up lands previously dedicated to vineyards to serve, serve other agricultural activities. The physical transformation of Burgundy's vineyards also occasioned changes to the region's socio-cultural practices. Historian Robert Laurent previously noted that the phylloxera invasion completely upended those practices associated with the cultivation of the vine. Within the space of a few years, he continues, the secular traditions considered immutable, were swept away by the terror unleashed by the terrible louse. For example, small growers would, had previously planted all manner of fruit trees, beans, tubers, and vegetables in and around their vineyards, not to mention pasturing animals. This meant that growers were found engaging in different forms of cultivate, excuse me, of different, in different forms of cultivation among their vines throughout the year. Indeed, artists and folkways traditionally identified with the wine industry were permanently altered to reflect these, new pra these practices and their changes. The new, more homogenous post phylloxera vineyards were visited only as labors were necessary for vineyard maintenance. Labors were increasingly gendered, with women performing most of the cutting and trimming. As new practices evolved in and around the vineyards and villages dedicated to post phylloxera wine industries, the cultural value and economic desirability of the new terroir eclipsed the perceived value of neighboring non-wine growing areas as well as those producing wines of lesser quality. A new culture of wine in the vine became emblematic of entire regions, such as Burgundy's Côte d'Or, with, with, along with their corresponding activities, such as wine tasting events, um, the, the staging of gastronomic festivals designed to attract tourists and promote sales, et cetera, et cetera. Such is a sampling of the unanticipated cultural consequences of the phylloxera epidemic. 
The blight also had an important equalizing, so, an equalizing socioeconomic effect in Burgundy because large wine growers were reluctant to graft given the costs associated with starting anew and despite the advantages that economies of scale provided, along with the fact that their reputations were linked to their pre philixar wines, small to medium French winemakers who grafted were able to compete for a while against the large growers and merchants who had hitherto dominated the wine trade. Those willing to invest in newly imported American plants and learn the necessary grafting techniques gained a competitive edge and, and sooner returned productive yields in a contracted market. Laurent, Roger Laurent notes that small landholders holder, held on. The small, they had, small landholders that had not wanted to abandon his vines provided the example for reconstruction. During the first quarter of the 20th century, small Growers, two to three hectares, um, as six might require the labor of two or three families, further learned to defend their interests by forming cooperative sellers. This at first allowed them to pull their purchasing power to acquire carbon by sulfide and injectors, and when their sellers began to refill, to better compete with large winemakers and merchants to ensure better prices for their wines. They were consequently able to survive in an industry that would, that would be beset by many more challenges and crises. Their success introduced an unanticipated rise of an entire class of small growers who started growing wines, quality wines, on small but productive parcels into, if not quite, the echelons of provincial notability, then at least a dis distinct social type. Starting in 1878, the Ministry of Agriculture provided substantial support uh, for the treatment and eventual replacement of phylloxeric vines, often up to 50% of cost with the expectation that departments and local institutions would provide additional, if not matching, funds. The practice of distributing these monies through municipal and communal organizations became a first and defining instance of publicly recognizing the equivalent interest among growers of different sizes and reputations. While this experience of reliance on public support did not unleash as many feared incipient socialism among the growers, it did demonstrate the advantages of general collaboration outside of harvest time. Two new institutions resulted, wine syndicates and, as mentioned before, wine cooperatives. Syndicates serve the public while cooperatives serve the interests of growers ex exclusively. The first syndicates in Burgundy were founded in 1870 and were important in supporting treatments for ailing vines while a consensus was still developing concerning um, definitive solutions to the problem. Syndicates retained importance after the crisis as they continued to provide information and technical assistance in economy of scale when purchasing remedies, organized lobbying at political levels, and a system of coordination against future blights, such as another American import, black rot, in the, in the 1880s. Once French vines regained their vigor by 1900, cooperatives emerged, only legal since 1884, to retain the advantages of collective purchasing power, and more importantly, to gain the advantages necessary to compete in an era of overproductivity and international competition. These included the pooling together of resources and vine, wines to compete with large growers and to eliminate middlemen such as négociants and courtiers in order to guarantee better sale prices and profits. Cooperatives were also able to borrow money to support their members during difficult economic times and help to ensure the survival of the small vigneron. And as, now to conclude, I'd just like to underscore the fact that the survival and development of Burgundy's post phylloxera vineyards on lands best suited for wine growing positioned the region's industry to pursue the production of higher quality wines. Refashioned vineyards, socioeconomic restructuring, qual quality produits de terroir, newly invented traditions, the glorifying discourse of terroir, the legal support in the form of the système d'appellation d'origine contrôlée um, in the early 20th century, all contributed to promote a, a regional revival and avert potential catastrophe. The scale and scope of this transformation was so far-reaching that one may agree that Burgundy's wine country is of relatively new vintage. Thank you.